Welcome to the Campus Ministry Today podcast. I'm Paul Wooster with my buddy, my mentor, my bro, Dr. Steve Shadrach. And we're here today talking about, actually, we're going to go into seven principles for movement, for a campus ministry movement. And uh, it was actually, Shad just did this whole session for the Collegiate Coaching Network that I lead for NAM. And he said he packed 30 minutes, he packed two days of content into 30 minutes. And so, and it was, it was a jam packed, it was like drinking from a fire hydrant. So what we talked about doing is having Shad share those principles, and then we'll stop after each principle and I will have questions and we'll interact more informally as he, so it'll be a mix of presentation and discussion between the two of us. And this was gold. Like we had a flood of, on the live call, we had a flood of people wanting to ask questions and then people wanting one-on-one time with Chad afterwards. And uh, so, yeah, that was, that was a blast. So we wanted to kind of reproduce that dynamic a little bit here on the podcast. And so let's just jump into that without any further ado. How about I pray for us? And uh, then I'll pitch it off to you, Shad, and you can do the more of the presentation, and we'll just make it have have some fun with it. How about that, Father? Good. Thank you for this special podcast we get to have here and discussing um, really important keys to seeing a movement on a campus. And I pray that you would guide Shad that even as he is doing these teaching sections, that he would remember that he's speaking to hundreds of leaders and. You would guide him and anoint him and um, even guide our conversation as we discuss at each point. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm, mm, mm. So take it away, bro. Okay, buddy. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I love doing these podcasts with Paul and, and these uh, these coaching networks are just fantastic. If you're a, if you're a, a church-based or a campus-based worker out there and you want to plug into one of these coaching networks, um, we can reach out to one of us, especially Paul, and uh, he can get you plugged in because it's a great experience for everybody. Uh, yeah, this one, uh, we're kind of using that phrase, ministry to movement, uh, on a lot of different things. Our training and a book we supposedly are writing together, right, Paul? Uh, but to, but the, the subtitle is Launching a Campus Ministry Movement here on our little session today. And two days of training reduced to 30 minutes, so I'm going to move fast. Um, but I, 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 I like to challenge groups to kind of think through, uh, you know, are they a ministry or a movement? There's nothing wrong with ministries. Those are fantastic. Most of the people watching or listening today would be part of a ministry for sure on a campus. And uh, there's probably other Christian ministries. There may be five or 10 or 15 or more on your campus, and yet seldom of the all the what, 40 plus years that I've been, you know, on different campuses, um, seldom do I see a movement. Now, that's my personal opinion, of course, but um, I, I thought about, gosh, if I'm on a campus, do I simply want to be, you know, ministry number 11 or ministry number 16, or would I like to be movement number one? And so uh, that idea of aspiring uh, to leadership, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but these seven principles that we're going to kind of race through, and Paul's going to really try to interact with us on it to give us some some of his great perspective. Um, we're going to uh, talk about, if, if you're starting from scratch on a campus ministry or you're already going with your campus ministry, how do you launch or transition or develop it into what we might call a movement? Okay, that's what we're talking about. So number one is to saturate the entire campus in ongoing fervent prayer. And this this... This idea, don't just do it, you know, the, the first day of class or, uh, you know, once a week. I mean, this is something that really I, I talk, I, I say, make it ongoing, make it fervent, make it where you're, you're pulling your staff and your students in. This is a, uh, has a twofold value to it, really. Uh, the first one, it, it builds a, a burden in our own heart. I mean, it builds this vision and burden and passion in our own heart. The more we pray, the more we want to reset campus. That's what Jesus really talked about in Matthew 9, 36 through 38. It's a very sneaky verse, I think, Paul, a very dangerous verse, you know, where uh, he says, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. 
Pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest, send out workers into his harvest. Well, you'd expect him to say the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Now get out there and start <laughs> witnessing. No, he says to pray because he knows if we will pray, we will want to witness. We will want to labor. We'll want to be, you know, a, a, a solution to this problem of lostness across our planet. So it builds a heart into us. But also, secondly, God uses it. Uh, James 4, 2, we have not because we ask not. The times that I have prayed in my life, the times that I have really saturated a campus in prayer, I've seen God do amazing things. But sometimes I get prideful. I get full of myself. I think it's my skills, my talents, my e even my praying. Somehow my praying, you know, is the key. No, 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 no. Uh, you know, it, it's I've got to be continuously praying and asking specifically. And so I love the prayer walks. I know you do this too, Paul, but the prayer walks around the campus, you know, early morning prayer walks. And we, we, we bring staff, we bring students, we divide up into twos and we're dorm by dorm, fraternity house by fraternity house, you know, you know, uh, international section by international section, you know, uh, uh, building by building, major by major, you know, and I've gotten in trouble a few times with that. You know, I, I've, 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 I've had early morning prayer, I mean, sometimes like it was 3.30 in the morning. I know that sounds a little strange, friends, but here I am standing in front of a dormitory with a guy, and we're lifting up our hands in front of the dorm, you know, praying floor after floor after floor, and the, and the, and the police pull up, the, the, the campus cops, you know. Uh, Betty, uh, what, uh, what are you doing there? Oh, <laughs> yeah, we're praying. You're what? We're, we're praying for this dorm. You know, at first they don't believe you, but after the second, third, fourth time they see you doing it, they go, oh, yeah, those are the... Those are the religious nuts. That's right. So this idea of, of initial, ongoing, fervent prayer with you, your staff, your students, God's going to use that in amazing, amazing ways. Yeah, no that's, question. I mean, that's the most important of all the points, really, <laughs> when you think about it, is I, I have a training I do called 10 Keys for Evangelistic Momentum, which is has a lot of very similar stuff to this. But my last point it's actually point number nine. So because the last point is make a plan for all the new believers. So anyways, but um, that point about prayer, mobilizing prayer and personally being a person of prayer and fostering a culture of prayer, really, that is, that's the foundation of everything else. And so we can't, that's the one thing as a ministry leader that you can't delegate. <laughs> you can delegate just about everything else, speaking at the weekly meeting or discipling or whatever else, but prayer, covering your, your ministry, your campus in prayer, the student leaders, the staff, you know, I'm challenged by Samuel. He said, far be it from me that I would sin against the Lord and fail to pray for you. And so there is a sense in spiritual mm. leadership that we are lifting up and praying over the people in our ministry. So also not just the people in our ministries, but the campus as a whole and the loss on campus. And uh, so that's that's something that that is very deep and important in my life. And what is that kind of, what have you learned over the years, um, Shab, about being consistent personally kind of in your prayer life over the years? I'm just a fool sometimes, Paul. I, I when when I pray, God works. When I don't pray, I mean, sometimes God works in spite of my right. you know prayerlessness. But I think the amount of prayer, the, the 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 quantity and quality of my prayer, it reflects the quantity and quality of my dependence upon God. And you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so this this daily dependence is what He's looking for. You know. S.D. Gordon is one of my favorite authors, and he's from the last, you know, uh, previous centuries. You know, I think I, I think uh, maybe even the Civil War. He and I were, you know, serving together in the Civil War. I think, uh, but he said, he said, he said, he said, prayer is the real work yeah. of the ministry. He then added, service is just simply gathering in the wow. results of prayer. If we can just believe that and get it into our mind and get it into our heart. So the second principle, though, Paul, it's it, it it really follows up number one, but but it's and, and and if we can view God differently, view the campus differently, view prayer differently, you know, 
the second one is start to view your campus differently. And so there are many ministries out there, like I said, but seldom is there a movement. And so I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad in this, in this podcast. I really want to challenge you to aspire to leadership. That's what 1 Timothy 3.1, Paul was saying to Timothy. He said, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to aspire to leadership. So don't you want, of course you do, you'd say, Lord, if you had your total way on this campus, what would be the maximum impact that you, Lord, would want to make in and through this campus, in and through our lives, in and through our ministry? We don't want to limit that. We're not satisfied with just having our little ministry. No, we want to see God do everything that he wants to. And so that, that may require big vision, may require big prayers. It may require, you know, stepping out in faith and, and, and exercising some, some courage, you know. And so what if he did have his total way? What, what would that look like? Uh, what, that's, that's what you and I need to start praying towards for our campus, to envision, you know, to, to, to believe that this can take place so it will take place. And that builds into the minds and hearts of your students, big time, friends. If they see and sense you taking these prayer walks and you're praying big prayers, big prayers, movement kind of prayers, uh, those students, that, uh, that only attracts the right kind of leaders, strong leaders, but it develops strong leaders, you know. And so I have found over the years, Paul, <coughs> about f- uh, two and a half to five percent of the total campus is involved in one of these church-based or campus-based collegiate ministries. Well, what, what, what happens to the other 95 percent? Who, who's going after them? And it, it's seldom that I see a ministry going after what I call the heart of the campus, the unreached section. Uh, a lot of them are kind of nibbling around the edges, hoping to get their 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 students to come to their weekly meeting or, or Thursday, you know, pizza luncheon or something. I'm being, I'm being uh, facetious here. I know I'm sorry, but I want to challenge folks to say, I'm not satisfied in just doing what everyone else is doing. You know, if you could look in my office right now, you'd see the Dawson Trotman quote here. It says, never do anything that someone else can and will do when there is so much of importance to be done, which others cannot or will not do. So what if you were to say, Lord, I want to be the person on my campus that's going to go to the heart of the campus because I'm not satisfied just having a a ministry nibbling around the edges. I want to go after the unreached person. So that means that you've got to really study your campus. You've got to become the Sherlock Holmes of your campus. And and you're studying that campus. And you know what's happening at 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. and midnight and, and and where all the different groups are, all these different affinity groups. You know, what are they doing? Where are they? And so you know the campus better than anyone, okay? And you yeah. become the campus host. I mean, it's like you own that campus. You know, you, you're showing up a few days before campus because why? Because you're welcoming all the students to, <laughs> to your campus. That's right. It's your campus. And, uh, and so I just think you need to claim that campus for God, claim it for Jesus Christ. And that's why uh, you may have a building, uh, you may have an office, uh, friends, sorry to be so, you know, radical here, but if I were you, if you could sell that building or give that building away or, 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 or unleash that office or something, I don't know. But if, if that backpack on your back and you, your office, that campus becomes your office. And so you're not dive bombing. You're not, you're not in your office. You go, well, I got a 10 o'clock appointment. And you're dive bombing to campus at 10. Oh, you scurry back to the camp. And then, you know, at 2.30, you got to, well, I'm going to dive bombing to campus again at 2.30, my point. I'm going to back back to my, the safety of my office, you know. Friends, you're never going to start a real movement unless you go, you yourself, your body, your mind, your heart, your soul, to the heart of that campus yourself. And, and next, Paul, I think, it, 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 still, we're still on the second principle of how you view your campus differently. But but what if you were to really, truly, we've talked about this before, but to enjoy your students, to like them, to want to be with them. It's not a job. It's not an obligation. It's not a responsibility. No, you actually yeah. like these students. You enjoy them. You want to be around them. Friends, that'll be like a magnet. That's a gospel mm. magnet. There's nothing that will open up the heart of a student or anyone more to the gospel than if they sense you like them, you want to be with them. And, and so um, I, I could give you, you, you need to go to one of our 
webcasts, one of our podcasts where Blake Brewer, you know, talked about this, this idea of, of just enjoying and loving students. And I mean, when you talk about a magnet, they want hundreds and hundreds of key student leaders to Christ at that Missouri State campus. And uh, they just, that thing mushroomed. They couldn't find rooms big enough to hold the students. And, you know, taking 500 students to Christmas conferences and 200 key leaders to summer projects. And so you, listen to that one if you would. So to, to, so to view students differently means viewing them as full of potential, yeah. not problems. Some of the ministries that I'm around, Paul, they, um, they view their students kind of in a negative way. They, they, they say these 18-year-olds that are coming, you know, into our college campus, they're struggling. They're, 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 they're from dysfunctional families. They're wounded. They, they, they're depressed. They're, they're, they have all these, uh, you know, issues in their life. And, well, friends, I'm not saying there aren't some students like that, and those things are not real. They are. But if you, if you blanket that with all students on your campus, that that's where they're all coming from, you're going to end up basically being a counseling ministry is what you are. Don't, don't think you're going to be a labor factory, you know. And so um, I, I've worked with all kinds of students, and even the ones that are kind of from rough backgrounds or have kind of a, a, a self-focus, a me-focus, or depression or whatever. Paul, I think you found this too, that the way to get them their eyes off themselves and all their own issues or problems is to lift their eyes up to Jesus Christ and to get them involved in reaching others. That, that, that'll that solve a lot of those problems. So lastly, I think, is to view your campus here through the lens of affinity groups. Not 28,000 people, that's overwhelming, but but really start to study what are the subcultures, what are all the different living groups, the the clubs, the affinity groups, the teams, the you know how have students gathered themselves together and built their networks of relationships? Yeah. Study those, know those, start to pray over those, start to think through which of those groups that you want to you know start to go after. And friends, uh, a key a key component for a, a movement is that you view your campus as a launching pad as a sending base to the nations this has to be that the, the, the e has to be their evangelism the d has to be their the disciple making but friends don't leave the m out that also has a way of attracting strong leaders and developing strong leaders is to view your campus as a means to an end mm, to reach the that's nations. That's so good. That is that one point had multiple points that are just gold. <laughs> you know, each one we could pull out and maybe that would be a chapter of the upcoming book. You know, we can kind of work our way through it. But um, yeah, I think the idea of affinity groups is a really crucial concept uh, for collegiate ministry leaders to latch on to and make a, a big part, a major part of their ministry strategy. Now, there's kind of two, several different types of evangelism that you can do. You can do the fall outreach ministry mode, um, large groups, kind of get that wide funnel on the campus and see how many freshmen you can reach. And I'm, of course, Chad and I are all for that. And then there's also initiative evangelism that we've seen God use initiative evangelism efforts where you can find i i recommend looking and praying over good contextualized ways to do that and to not make that the only way that you engage the campus because then you could just be known as that ministry that's just hitting up people kind of randomly but that is we've seen god use i've seen god use that method even though it doesn't work anymore but I think the bread and butter, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's nothing random, like, there's that was nothing a joke. random That's about right. random evangelism, right? It's like when you share the gospel, God's sovereignty is at play, and he's leading willing laborers to the abundant harvest. And so there is this, like, this thing that God does in those moments. But really the bread and butter of movements that we've seen across the nation is ongoing relational evangelism in a community. And so thinking through the campus as a waffle and not a pancake. We want to get the spirit of the gospel into every, every <laughs> cranny. Some of our OCD friends, you know, when you're eating your waffle, you want to get that syrup in every single little, little nut. And that's the same thing. We want to see the gospel 
in every fraternity, every sorority, every athletic team, every dorm, every major. And this is not about anything other than love. This is about loving these students that there are barriers to many of these affinity groups that if we don't have someone intentionally go in and pray for these students, love these students, share the gospel with these students, no one else will. And so a lot of times those, yep. those people that we're most intimidated by <laughs> the cool, the athletic, the, you know, the D1 athletes or the Greeks or whatever, fill in the blank. Or even the really smart psychology majors or whatever it is, you know, it's often the ones that we are most intimidated by are the least reached students on campus. And they also have a potential to see the most movement and spiritual multiplication through their lives at a lot of times. I've seen the biggest partiers become the best evangelists. (laughs) <laughs> and so, yeah, Chad, yep. any stories yep. come to mind personally for you on that, that kind of point about um, sometimes those most intimidating are also the most open slash influential? Yeah. Well, I think just the Apostle Peter. I mean, what a rough cut. Uh, I remember helping a guy come to Christ uh, that was – really kind of version of, of the apostle Peter. I mean, he just was kind of a bull in a China yeah. shop kind of a guy, you know, and, uh, and, but everybody loved him and respected him and knew him. And, and, uh, and I remember, um, uh, one of the guys that I got to disciple led him to Christ. And so the very next day, um, my guy, Terry, uh, was going to take Kirk out, uh, to share the gospel not randomly, but with three of their yeah. old high school football buddies. And so I said, can I just come along? Just, I'll, I promise I'll sit on the bed there in the dorm room and kind of just be quiet, you know, like a little fly on the wall or something. Well, Kirk took over, you know, I mean, he, he, he had only been a Christian 24 hours, but he, he lined his three guys up in chairs and now he's given this sermon out of the gospel of these guys. Paul, he was butchering the gospel. I mean, it was bad. I was over here just wincing. Oh, 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 you know, just, you know, but I promised I wouldn't say anything, you know. And so at the end of his sermonette, you know, these three guys are all looking right at Kirk, you know. And so Kirk says, well, Joe, what do you think? You ready to receive Christ in your life? And Joe says, yeah, I, I am. Sam, how about you? You, you ready to make a commitment today to, you know, Make Jesus your Lord. Yes, I am. I am. You know, Bobby, how about you? You know, all three guys bowed their head. And I'm sitting there going, wow. what is happening? What what just happened here? I thought you had to have this perfect gospel illustration. And I realized it wasn't the eloquence of words. It was the power of the gospel and the power of a changed life. Well, bro, that guy has spent the last 45 years of his life wow. in China. And there are 10 generations or 15 generations of disciples all spread out across that, that country as a result of the Apostle <laughs> Peter Kirk, who came to Christ. Right. You know, so anyway, that's the kind of guy, if you can ever, you know, get, get hold of, God's got a plan for them. And so that really is kind of the third principle that kind of ties in, Paul, where the, the, the seven principles of, of, of starting, launching a movement on your campus is, <laughs> excuse me, to pull your leaders together and, and to look at those affinity groups, to start listing them. I mean, we, we get a whiteboard out every semester. We, we list them, and, and then we evaluate them. I know this is sound. Some of you are going, you're kind of you know, a little bit uncomfortable. Now, what do, you, what do you mean evaluate them, Steve? You know, well, let's just list them first. You know, or, you know what, what are the 20 that you know of, the 30, the 40, the 50? And, and start, but then you're evaluating them, not based on how much money they have or how pretty they are, how cool they are. You know, no, 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 no. It's purely the, the, the way you're going to kind of rank them and evaluate them is the quantity and quality of their relationship, the relational networks that they're part of. Okay? And, and, and the more... The, the more folks in that particular affinity group and the tighter those relationships are, the more chance you have to see a movement, a little mini movement in that group. It, it, it's, it's what 
it's what missionaries do all the time. Win the chief, win the tribe. You know, it's what Paul told the, the disciples to pair up in Luke 8, Luke 9, Luke 10 to go into a town and look for that person of peace, that that insider, you know, that, that's part of an affinity group. That if you if you build that relationship with that insider, you know, boom, you now have access to that whole affinity group that he's part of or or that she's part of. So you know, this is these are what we call mainstream students. Uh, don't don't get uh, don't get caught up in that word. That word mainstream. We're just saying is they have a strong relational network. Okay, and so that that that's not cruel. That's not unkind. That's not exclusive. You're just you you you're you're not you, you want to try to have the most strategic ministry you possibly can. Friends, you only have one life. You only have one ministry. Uh, why not make it the most strategic ministry, the most strategic life you possibly can, okay? And so some of us are going, well, Steve, I'm not real comfortable with that. Uh, well, you might evaluate yourself. Why are you not comfortable with that? Well, if you were not part of an affinity group or one of these top affinity groups or, or had a strong relational network in college, this may sound a little intimidating to you. But but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I mean, I you know, I, 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 I sometimes say to groups, Paul, you know, you're, 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 to staff people, you're 24, you're 28, you're 32, you're, you're 38, you're 45. You know, at what point are you going to quit being intimidated by 19-year-olds? You know, please, uh, they're, they're ready and waiting for us, you know, to, to, to come to them. So, uh, but then we, we start assigning these affinity groups, okay? Now you're starting to look at the group by group and say, which staff person, which student leader does it make sense? Does it make sense? Maybe they're part of that group. Maybe their best friend is part of the group. Maybe they live next door to that group. Maybe they just, you know, what, what, where, where can you kind of match them up where now each person is taking one, two, maybe even three, if you're a staff person, you know, of one of these affinity groups this semester, this school year, that you're going to start to pray, start to really penetrate, start to build relationships, and, and start to sm start small groups. And we're going to talk about that next, okay? So, Last question here on this principle, Paul, is this. Why are you targeting the students you are targeting? Please don't do it out of a comfort level. That, 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 that Without faith, that impossible to please God. He wants you to operate in your discomfort level, okay? So which students you target, friends, I promise you, it will determine whether you have multiplication or simply addition, Okay. You need to be asking yourself and those around you that key question, why am I targeting the students I am? This is what Paul was asking, challenging, imploring Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. He said, Timothy, the things which you heard from me in the presence of wit many witnesses, I want you to be very, very picky about who you give this to. The things which you heard from me, you know, I want you to, I want you to give them, to deposit them, it's a banking term, into faithful men, but don't forget that second part, who will be able to teach mm -hmm. others also. So friends, you got this little window of time called college, okay? They're there three, four, or five years, you know, me six, oops. And, uh, and, and, and so there's a real limited amount of time. So who are you supposed to choose? D don't just kind of choose anybody. No, Paul says, no, fine, faithful men, but also they have enough social and emotional and relational and spiritual maturity that they're able to pass it on to others also. That's kind of a rare college student these days, Paul, that, that, that has that kind of a, a, you know, willingness and maturity to take what you give them, and they have a built-in relational network that they, now they have some people to pass it on to. That's called multiplication. So decide, do I want addition or do I want multiplication? And if I want multiplication, I better choose wisely which Yes, and that's so good. And um, actually, the heart of the campus is a little ebook that Chad wrote that gives a more robust case for why the, his his thinking behind it. And he, he actually dispels some of the myths, some of the kind of straw man arguments against this strategy. Um, and one of those, let's just go ahead and hit on one of them. <laughs> um, I think for, for your, I want to be kind of help you out a little bit, bro, because sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes people give you a bad rap or, or kind of this affinity group um, influencer strategy and they, they pigeonhole it as this is just about reaching fraternities and sororities or groups or the, the kind of the, the more kind of more 
like substantial like and like hard claim to deal with it is not not that <laughs> well let me just rephrase this like the one that hurts more is some people would even accuse this as violating that command in James 4 not to show favoritism to people um so let's hit on that one first how is this not showing favoritism um but it's more of a missional strategy um in this so that's a hard question but well i guess i i guess i guess we could ask paul as he's sitting in that prison in second timothy he's writing that final letter to timothy you know that second timothy 2 verses 1 through 4 our re, our, our listeners need to go back and look at those verses yeah, i guess you could accuse yeah. paul of that paul are you are you telling timothy to select people and does that mean they're not mm -hmm. selecting others? Well, that doesn't feel good in our culture right now. You know, we, inclusion, inclusion is the key, right? Not exclusion. And so, but Paul was saying, uh, no, Timothy, don't choose everybody. Don't select everybody. Uh, you got to be very, very picky. And here's the criteria. And so, um, yeah, yeah, um, you're going to get some pushback from that. I promise you. Um, I've said this before, but that classic, the, the master plan of evangelism by Robert Coleman, the eight principles that Jesus goes through in his ministry. I mean, people, staff, staff groups love it when we present that, Paul, to them, except the room gets very cold and, and frigid when we talk about one selection. particular principle, yeah. mm -hmm. selection. Ooh, that doesn't have a good feel to it. So friends, you're going to have to go against the grain of your culture. You're going to have to go against the grain of your own fears and, and, and the, these suppositions that you've got built into your mind to say, yes, all students are equally important, but like Bill Bright, the founder of Crew, says, but not all students are equally strategic. That 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 sounds very, uh, you know, exclusive, very you know, politically incorrect, but it just depends. Do you want to multiply and have a movement, or you just simply want to add? And have yeah, a little here's some kind of way I, I kind of help people think think through this this idea is yes anyone that comes to us and or that we have an opportunity to share the gospel with just we're gonna do it we're gonna it's not like we're running past people that would otherwise want to be saved or whatever you know it's, and it, we're not intentionally excluding in that way. And there is environments like, especially if you're a church and you have a church service, you're going to hey, come one, come all, mm -hmm. let's preach the gospel. Let's get people in that kind of thing. But as missionaries to the campus, it's wise to have specific contextualized strategies to reach specific people and to do things that make sense yeah. to those at those athletes or those you know fill in the blank whatever it is and because that's that's the most effective way to get the gospel out on the campus as a whole and so it's not saying that, yeah it might be yeah so I'm, we're not no one is saying that you neglect or ignore people that no, that, that need the gospel, that are open to the gospel. So I'm I'm pro having environments like your large group meeting or other places that can be a great catch-all for anyone that, that can yep. come and be a part of your ministry. We're more talking about specific, what your staff, what your top-level student leaders, who are they seeking to reach out to? And often, like we've had people in the band or in the drama department or whatever, fill in the blank, and they may not, or th some other affinity group that's more of a niche affinity group, and they may not qualify as like the most influential, but because they're already in that group, we're equipping them to reach out to their peers yep. and to be intentional with that. So I think there's a, don't, don't mm -hmm. hear what we're not saying. I mean, I guess I said that weird, but you know what I say, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're saying this is about loving students being intentional in those things. So sure. that's kind of my my little apologetic for it, I guess. No, that's good, Paul. And really, it may boil down to what are you majoring in, what are you minoring in? Uh, Jesus majored on his 12 disciples, 
But boy, like you said, he he did not want to. He he wanted to make himself available to others. He was he was ministering to others. But you could tell the heart and soul of his strategy with those twelve men. And I guess you could also say, well, Jesus, I guess yeah. you were playing favorites too. You picked these twelve guys, and that means you didn't pick all these other guys. You know, <laughs> naughty no no. Uh, and so um, I I think the concept of 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 who you choose and why you choose them uh is it's important and so look at the life of jesus look at the life of paul uh why and where and when and how they did that would be very uh i think educational number number four i think is where we are of these four of these seven principles paul but really once you've kind of got the affinity groups you're thinking through and you're praying through and you kind of got them assigned now you and your staff and your student leaders need to really uh, launch out there and, 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 and try some things, experiment with some things, have some fun, take some risks. The, the idea is major now in launching small group investigative Bible studies into these key groups. Okay. And we still, especially in America, you still get away with starting a Bible study, you know, and a lot of times I don't call it that. I call it a, a discovery group, a, an action group, a John study. Uh, you know, I, I have a group called the immortal six, you know, and, Maybe you could you know pick up on the superhero idea or something, right? Um, but uh, so, but but the point is this: um, now you're trying to build relationships within that affinity group, and yes, share the gospel any opportunity you get. But a way to kind of get your foot in the door and get a start and is to gather individuals from that group together into a small group. And I, you know, I would do it you know, at least four, but, but probably not more than eight. You know, I, I wouldn't just put up a sign. If anybody wants to come to Bible study on Tuesday nights at nine, uh, friends, I've, I've tried that over time, the years, over the years. And, uh, if, if, a, if, if a study is for everybody, it kind of ends up being for nobody. And people like to feel special. They like to feel invited. They like to feel recruited and, but they, they like to go to something yeah. where they know each other. Uh, have you ever tried to start a Bible study with eight people and they did not know each other? I mean, it's like sometimes pulling teeth to get them to want to come and relate to each other. And, you know, you're trying to fry the refreshments and the the icebreaker and the jokes and the environment. And, you know, we're gonna, and for some reason, it just doesn't it doesn't happen. But if they already know each other. The reason they're going to come to your study is not because you're great teaching or even your great Chick-fil-A that you brought. No. It's because they know each other. This generation, the only reason they need to do anything yeah, is who else right. is going. And then secondly, is it fun? You know, but first is who else is going? So that's that that's a biggie. And so I I I, I want I, I want to challenge our listeners, our watchers today to focus on non believers. Okay. We've got a number of ministries out there that really they're just kind of reorganizing Christians. I was meeting with the leader of a major campus ministry organization because I was doing two days of training with all of their staff, and I wanted him to feel good about some of these movement principles I'd be preparing, you know, or sharing. And and I said to him as we were eating these chips and and, and salsa at the Mexican restaurant, Paul, I said one of the keys to a movement is that you always start with non Christians. I mean, he about swallowed his chips and his salsa whole. And he starts pounding the table like this. And he said, yes, yes, we are through reorganizing Christians. We are done reorganizing Christians. He goes, Shad, I want you to preach that to our staff. I said, okay, okay, I will, I will, I will. And so, friends, you know, you, you don't want to spend your life just rearranging Christians into groups. I mean, there, there's nothing evil about that. That's fine. And God's going to use that and, and use the word to touch people's lives. But let's go after the unreached. That's what Paul said, Romans 15, 20. I, I want to go where Christ is not known, not preached. I don't want to build on another man's foundation. And so why don't you be a Romans 15, 20 person on your campus, okay? And go after the non-believers. That, that's the heart of the campus. And like, I, like I mentioned, recruit it, you know, recruit them to a limited size group. We're going to talk about recruiting, actually, in the next podcast that we do. But and So we'll be talking about recruiting. But again, be very careful about which students you recruit and which student you even recruit first. So if you're an affinity group and you're thinking through, I want to start a group of six and there's 30 in this group, 
which one, you know, which one do I start with? You better start with someone that is somewhat well liked in the group. If you if you pick the guy first that nobody wants to hang out with, you 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 will yeah. not be able to start that group. And so I try to identify who who the persons of peace are in each of those affinity groups and build relationships with them and get with them and talk to them about this idea of a small group. What do you think? Immortal six, six people. We're going to study biblical manhood. We're going to meet for X number of weeks. What do you think? Do you think that would be helpful to you, helpful to your guys? And then you're saying, who do you think would be good in that group? Who would you like to have in the group? You're, you're helping them form a, a tight knit group of relationships there, but you're going after non-Christians. I say, I don't want anybody who's you know, religious, or they, you know, they're in Bible studies, or they're going to church, you know. No, 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 no. It's going to be a fun, non-religious, purely discussion-oriented session. You're not teaching. You're only bringing questions, okay? You're not praying. You're not singing. You're not speaking in tongues. You're, you, you're just there as, as a relational small group uh, uh, to go. Yeah. You're using the word, but but it's it, it's the, the group becomes a means to an end because— you're ultimately wanting to win the right to share the gospel with each of those people, and and, and a book that that recently one of our one of our, our friends, a pastor in in in, um, in 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 Arizona, Brian Smith, wrote called "The Battle to Belong." He's so right that what's in the mind of these students before they're even thinking about the battle to believe what they should or should not believe regarding the gospel, their biggest need, especially their felt need, is the battle to belong. What 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 group are they going to be part of? Who's going to accept them? Who's going to? And so these little studies can be amazing little uh, little battle to belong groups, Paul. Where where now they really want to come to this group. They want to talk about these things. They want to be honest and and open with these 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 friends of theirs and their affinity group. I've just seen it happen over and over and over again. Where God, yes, I that. totally recommend trying to start. These affinity group based evangelistic Bible studies, whatever you call them, discovery groups, et cetera. But the thing about those is they help kind of sift who in that affinity group has some level of interest in spiritual things, some level of openness. So it's kind of a great way, if you're recruiting towards that Bible study, to find those, the ones that'll be, that'll show up to that. Those may be the ones that God's already working in. And sometimes, a lot of times, it's a process for them coming to know Christ over the course of a semester. And then our goal when I'm training students is to set up those gospel appointments um, throughout the course of that semester. So they're doing that evangelistic Bible study, but then they're trying to set up one-on-one times with each of those individuals. Give them a chance to hear hear their story share their testimony, and then share a gospel presentation and ask the golden question, would you like to make Jesus Lord of your life right now? And so that's kind of their their goal is to get into an affinity group relationally, build relationships. A lot of times students are already in their affinity group and the real step starting yep. or recruiting towards a evangelistic Bible study, and that can be a great way to break the ice and discover people that God is working in. And then from there, work a process of sharing the gospel with those people. So there's nothing random about it. It's just, it's a comprehensive approach that, that works as one of the, one of the great methods of evangelism. So anything you'd add to that before we move on, Chad? Yeah. Well, you really hit on on number five uh, that 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 yeah, the goal is not to have a Bible study. You know, don't pat yourself on the back. And, yeah, I've got three Bible studies. You know, uh, you know how many do you have? You know, uh, no. Um, it, th- again, it's a means to an end. It's a means to love those students, to build relationship with those students. But like number five, this fifth principle is. Now, remain focused on ongoing relational evangelism. These other kinds of evangelism are helpful. God uses them. They're good for training. But I think you're going to see some some of the best, uh, deepest, most quality, long-lasting fruit if, if, if you can see some conversions from, from individuals that you know you built a relationship with, and they're part of a relational network themselves. They're making that decision in the context of these relationships. Um, and so 
Um, yeah, so what I like to do is when I start these groups, Paul, <coughs> I like to promise the guys, hey, listen, guys, um, sometime during the semester here, I want to treat you to a breakfast or a lunch or a coffee, you know, um, and, um, and I want to be able to kind of lay out for you a personalized, customized presentation of, of how you can discover where you're at in your journey with God. Really, Shad, you, you do that for me? <laughs> of course. Well, you know, I, what, what I do when I finally, you know, get, get them to that little back, room, back table of the pizza place, you know, for lunch where nobody goes for lunch <laughs> except us, uh, I'm just thankful I hadn't closed down yet, you know. But, but I, just, I, t- I, I take them through a little gospel booklet. I always have a young guy with me that I'm discipling and trying to build a, a, a heart for evangelism in him. But, you know, you don't have to use this little booklet, but it, it's, it's, it's a simple tool. The point is use a simple tool that's so produ- reproducible, so transferable, so simple that they would then know how to use it literally the next day like I did. I, I came to Christ, and the next day I was sharing this little booklet with a guy when I was 18 years old and led him to Christ. Why? Because I had learned how to read English, you know, and, and there it was. So, yeah, so the, 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 the idea of, of using the group as a means to now individually share the gospel with them. So use every gospel appointment as a training opportunity to bring young Christians along as you're discipling them. Like I said, use a tool that is simple, but also one that, that emphasizes the Lordship of Christ. Paul, I think I love, I love the bridge. I love a lot of different tools, but some of them, they focus in on the saviorship. Great. But, the, but, but where's the Lordship? It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's in there. So whatever tool you use, make sure you really do present the Jesus of the Bible. He is savior and he is Lord. And that's who you're asking them to, to receive into their life. Okay. And so, uh, it's so basic, so transferable. And then if you do focus on these highly networked students, Paul, what I've noticed, like recently I, I shared with you, I got to lead Sam to Christ and, and Sam was, um, you know, in a, in a fraternity and, um, and he had a built in relationship with all these guys. I mean, the very first thing he wants to do, uh, is to share with others because he's got this network of students. So friends, if you're going after these affinity groups and you do lead one of these guys or these girls to Christ, whether it's in a, you know, a, a dorm or an athletic team or a club or a social group, you know, whatever it is, um, many times the very first thing they want to do is to take the gospel that you've shared with them and boom, immediately the, the ricochet effect starts kicking in. And they've got these close friends that they want to share the gospel with. That's why they are so strategic. That's why multiplication is so much uh, more possible, you know, with people that are part of a network of relationships than it is with an isolated student over here that doesn't know anybody. So if you want to start the multiplication process, that ricochet effect, mainly focus on building relationships, starting groups, sharing the gospel with people that have those built-in relationships where the gospel can easily start to move through through those friendships. That's great. Yeah, so many good points there. And thinking about what our ministry uses, we wrote our own gospel lesson that we have on our website that students can print out and bring to the gospel appointment. And really, it's just, it's kind of like a gospel track where they can read it, it has illustrations and So we can even put that in the show notes for people to check out. And that's been really helpful. It's a pretty robust, takes about 15, 20 minutes to go over with the student. And then it has a strong lordship illustration there. And uh, we share that with everyone that comes to any ministry events. And we've seen a lot of uh, Christians come to Christ. (laughs) We've seen a lot of people. (laughs) We've seen a lot of people that maybe they grew up in church, but they didn't have a real saving faith in Christ. Truly for the first time, turn from their sin, trust Christ as Savior and Lord. And so we just want to we want to give as many wow. students wow. as possible an opportunity to respond to Christ. And that's primarily done through course, ongoing relational evangelism and affinity groups. But that's that's kind of what we're, we're trying to do. So I love that. <laughs> love that point, Chad. Well, and once someone does come to Christ, this sixth principle is so essential, Paul. Uh, to do immediate follow-up, establishing and equipping of the new converts, okay? 
I know it's tempted to go when the guy, you know, a girl raises their head after they say amen and they pray to receive Christ in their life. You, Praise the Lord, brother. Welcome to the family. You know, see you in heaven, you know. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of blow off your six-shooter and put it back in your palm, you know, notch another one in your belt, you know, kind of go off. And you, you want to make sure everybody on Instagram knows you just led somebody to Christ, you know, kind of spiritual, you know. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you mind if we take a little selfie together? Because this will be the last time you and I ever talk. Oh, uh, no, no. No, no, because the first 24 hours are critical, friends. I mean, think about a newborn baby. I mean, those first few minutes, those first few hours, they're called in First Peter, babes in Christ. You know, that's who they are. And so, you know, you, you, you now are their spiritual parent, regardless of who they are. I, you know, if they're part of an affinity group or not a part of an affinity group, you're now their spiritual parent, right? And so that first few hours, those first few days, that first week, that first month, you know, I would focus on them starting to memorize scripture, especially the assurances. I, I, I use a little booklet, Paul, called, you know, Beginning with Christ. You know, it has five verses uh, that, that, that you can have them start memorizing. Assurance of salvation, assurance of forgiveness, assurance of answered prayer, assurance of, uh, of victory over temptation. I mean, those kinds of things, right? I get them started in a, a daily quiet time. And so the very next morning, I, I, I show up with a little seven minutes with God pamphlet, you know. And and I read a page, and they read a page. I read a page, and they read a page. I don't get fancy, friends. I don't try to impress them. I'm not trying to impress them at all. In fact, everything that I do, I want it to be so simple, so basic, so transferable that they could do it themselves. And they they, they go, Shadrach, is that all you got? I thought you went to seminary. I thought you were some big Christian leader, and all you do is read a little pamphlet with me. How quaint. And they go, even I could do that. Boom. If they, if they say that, even I could do that, you just won, friends, okay? And so uh, they're going to, and then get them witnessing to their friends ASAP. Some people go, no, I need to disciple them for a year before we start. With, no, 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 no. No, as soon as you, because friends, they're like wet cement. They're like wet semen. I know you've seen a sidewalk that was just poured. And what are you tempted to do? You know, put your hand there or put your initials there. Paul, I've done it several times, I confess. Uh, please don't turn me in, but, but friends, uh, whatever you, whatever handprints you put in that wet cement, is, is it daily quiet time? Is it scripture memory? Is it personal holiness? Is it, is it local church? Is it evangelism? Is it, is it, you know, whatever those principles are, personal Bible study, you know, world missions, you know, by the time the six month, uh, time frame rolls around, that semen is hardened. There's a reason that I'm still 50 years later still sharing this little booklet is because that what was shared with me when I was wet cement. It'll stick with them for a lifetime, friends, for good or for bad. That's a big responsibility, okay? It's scary. It's, you know, you do reproduce after your own kind. And, and, and so you want to be careful who you get that new Christian around. You want to get them around, you know, committed believers that are modeling the things you want them to model. And, but if you decide to neglect them, you know, have a good life. See you later. Praise the Lord. You know, I'll pray for you, bro. Well, neglected children usually become delinquent. Uh, and that's true in the spiritual life too. So, and, and, and also I, I don't pull them out of their affinity group. I know that you're tempted to go, okay, leave all these evil friends of yours and come to the spiritual group that we're, no, no, no. It's a both end. You want to help build them some brand new Christian relationships. And yes, expose them and get them involved in that Christian community at your ministry, your church, et cetera. But friends, what an opportunity of a lifetime. For them to stay right in that group, don't 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 move out, don't you know? But but now, how do you live for Christ? How do you be a witness for Christ in that affinity group, friends? If they, if you can help them do that, equip them to do that, they can take that that kind of conviction, that kind of skill, and apply it the rest of their life. They're going to be a world changer. That's exactly who they are. Okay, they're going to be like that Apostle Peter guy I was telling you earlier, Kirk. You know, uh, if you can help them do that, they're going to have spent a lifetime impacting. So. Now you are helping that new convert start their own evangelistic efforts, start their own small group studies, set up their own individual gospel appointments in their affinity group. Oh, it's a beautiful thing, friends. It's a beautiful thing. And if you get to a point 
that your key leaders, your key student leaders, your ministry team there on your campus is made up of mainstream students that you or your leaders led to Christ, and now they're equipping those students to reach out into their you know, respective affinity groups, guess what, friends? You are on the verge. You are on the verge of a campus-wide movement, one that is out of control, one that is Holy Spirit-controlled. You, you, you'll be amazed what God can do if you get to a point where that's the core of your students. And then lastly, in this point, Paul, is use your summers. Don't gear down during your summers. Gear up. So I, I started a summer training program 43 years ago, okay, called Kaleo, K-A-L-E-O. just means a Greek word to call, summon, or invite. So here they are 43 years later, you know, all along the, the coasts of, of Florida with student leaders, a thousand student leaders and six different projects because they, we didn't gear down during the summers. We use that as an incredible training opportunity stateside and overseas. So anyway, those are some, some kind of follow-up and equipping concepts that you better uh, inject into your movement, Paul. One of the things that stood out to me in this, what you just shared, was the importance of who your new believers get around. Um, not just you, but also you want to expose them to other believers that are going to have the DNA and have the values. Yep. Not that you're trying to hide them from everyone else or anything weird like that, but you are intentionally trying to help them create an environment and a culture of evangelism, disciple making, mm -hmm. mission mobilization, spiritual growth. Um, and that's actually a case for starting with non-Christians. Actually, when you start with non-Christians, you're more, it's easier to create the culture that you want because you can Good disciple point. students point. into, and they don't know any better. They don't know all the, the theological controversies that Christians love to talk about. They don't know that it's not normal to share the gospel as a lifestyle. <laughs> you know, you know, they, they are, they, they, that's what we experienced in Chico because we started with people that we led to Christ over the course of several years, you look around and the majority of the students in the room came to Christ through us or one of our student leaders or someone we trained. That's good. And That's there was good. this really healthy dynamic where they were mm -hmm. kind of all on the same page about the vision and the strategy and the mission of what we we're doing. And so I could feel really comfortable with a new believer coming into that environment and being like, Oh, this is, this is what it's about. And so you, that's part of creating a culture in your ministry. And uh, our goal was to help students go from lost to labor in one year, lost to labor in one year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That, wow. And so using awesome. the fuel in the flame as a, as a resource, shameless plug for the book, we would use that as a discipleship tool to cast vision to the students we were discipling. And then our summer projects, actually summer projects, I think is a secret sauce of ministries that are really pumping out laborers. And so we did, a, instead of going to the beach, mm -hmm. I guess our, our students weren't as fancy as the ones you're reaching and stuff. But, <laughs> but we, Oops, we started a Oops. local summer training project where they got jobs, they took summer classes, and on the nights and weekends, three nights a week and then weekend conferences and serving opportunities. We just discipled and we had a, more and more students do that every summer. And then we showed up with, if, mm -hmm. let's say 40, 50 students do that over the summer. You show up to your fall outreach. That's a small army that's ready to share the gospel and to reach students. Christ. And so Amen. use your summers, Amen. like Chad said, to ramp up not to slow down. And so we have articles. We have, I wrote an article called leading a local summer training project. We can put in the show notes. And then also Isaac yep. Jenkins from campus outreach wrote a summer project article as well. We can put in there. So there's lots of info on that. Maybe we could do a mm -hmm. whole podcast sometime on how to lead an effective summer training Ooh. project. That'd be a fun Oh man, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it could be you guys didn't go to the beach because you lived near the beach, Paul. Not, you know, all the campuses that I'm associated with, we're kind of, we're landlocked. We're landlocked in here. You know, we got to get to the beach, get to the beach somehow. Hey, number seven, we'll finish off here. 
Thank you for your patience if you've stuck with us this long. Uh, but, but to walk towards your fears in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we all have fears. Uh, it, it's scary. I, I, I have fears. Uh, and, and, and what am I going to do with those fears? You know, am, am I going to let them control me? Uh, Paul said, 2 Timothy 1, 7 to Timothy, who was struggling with fear, by the way. That was one of his, he was single, he was timid, he was alone, he was in Ephesus, he was being attacked from within, from without. His mentor of 17 years, Paul, was in a Roman prison about to be martyred. And his final letter, you know, final letter he's receiving, he's probably reading it, you know, by candle, hiding out in his, his bedroom, you know, and saying, what, you know, what, what am I supposed to do, Paul? How, what, how am I supposed to handle this? You know, I'm scared spitless, you know. Well, he said, um, uh, help, help me with the verse here, Paul. I'm mean, Second Timothy 1, 7. Um, For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and discipline or self-control. There you go. Thank you for bailing me out on that verse. Um, yeah. And so fear's not bad, friends. Don't, 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 don't beat yourself up if you're afraid. No, that's good. That, that means you're attempting something that's going to require faith. And faith pleases God. It also means that you're going to have to depend upon God to see it happen. God likes that. He likes that. He doesn't want you to operate in your comfort zone. He wants you to operate in your discomfort zone. So quit asking yourself on the campus, which group or part of the campus or students am I comfortable with? No. Do you say which group is the most strategic? And don't let fear make you, don't, don't let fear in your heart make those decisions for you. And so when you're asking yourself, why am I choosing the students I'm choosing? If fear's part of it, friends, don't, don't, don't allow that to take over, okay? Um, so persevere in staying focused on ongoing relational evangelism among mainstream students. That's, that's the key statement. If you, Paul, if you wanted to have a, a key statement on how do you launch and, and multiply and maintain and reproduce and scale movements on college campuses, that would be my statement right there, is stay focused on ongoing relational evangelism week in and week out among mainstream students, those who are part of relational networks, week after week, month after month. You're, you're going to see God work in some amazing ways. And, 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 and lastly here, a couple of final points, and I'm going to let you finish this off, Paul. But don't let the world conform you or sidetrack you, okay? These last few years especially, we've got all kinds of issues and causes that are floating all around us, the latest trendy causes that people lift up and exalt, and you know, all about race and gender and politics and vaccines and, you know, all this stuff floating around us. We're just beating each other up like crazy. And, and, and we can't say this, we can't say that, you know, it just, I've never, I've never felt as a Christian or as a body of Christ, Paul, more squeezed into a mold that we must conform, we must conform or else, you know? And I think that Romans 12, 1 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so friends, if, 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 don't let any of these causes, these issues, these things be, be exit ramps, exit ramps, exit ramps. I've seen it happen in hundreds of people's lives, Christian workers in all kinds of ministries uh, over the last three or four years, especially. What if you were to say, I'm going to be one of those Christian workers that I'm going to stay focused on EDM and I'm not going to let anything divide me or distract me or our ministry we're going to stay on the Great Commission Road. Friends, you will have opposition. You'll have opposition from Christians if you choose to do that. If you don't embrace their cause, if you don't embrace their issue, but you're going to stay focused on the Great Commission Road, oh, you're going to get lots of pushback. 2 Timothy 3.12 promises that Paul says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's a promise. And so I think you can be persecuted from, from, from non-Christians and Christians. And so I just think that we've got to remember that Jesus was the most loved person that ever walked the earth. He was also the most hated person 
that ever walked the earth. If you decide that you're going to give your life to starting movements on college campuses and not be distracted by anything else going on in this world, friends, God's going to use you in amazing ways, but there will be a price to pay to do that. I, I love that. And I think about the men and women that we bring on the podcast, many of them you've never heard of before, but they are living this lifestyle that we're describing. Guys like my mentor, Max Barnett, we have an episode with him or others like Isaac Jenkins that has been on campuses just in fraternity houses with his head down. We could hardly get time with him because he was like, well, I got a point with the guy I'm sharing with at 12. And then I guess I could squeeze you guys in for your podcast in between my other gospel appointments. We're kind of like, that is what we want to see. And this, he's in his sixties, you know, whatever it is. And it's, it's, that's, that's what we want to see happen. We want to see lifetime laborers, people that never grow out of what we're talking about, never move on from the basics. And so that's our vision. If you haven't noticed yet at Campus Ministry today, it's EDM, Evangelism, Disciple Making, Mission Mobilization. And so if you're getting tired of hearing about that, maybe find a different podcast, to be honest, because we're just going to stay in our lane. We're going to try to keep it interesting and not just say the same thing over and over again. But um, that's why we bring in guests and things like that. But that's our goal. It really, to be honest, we're shameless about that. So check out viastudents.org for more resources and for the show notes and things like that. And then, of course, the Fuel in the Flame book can be a great resource to instill and inject <laughs> these values into your student leaders. And I recommend using it with brand new believers as well, where it's written to kind of put the cookies on the bottom shelf. And so if you want to create that culture, even among your students, that, that's a resource for you. Another thing that we wanted to mention was if even this episode was interesting to you, insightful, you think, man, I'd love to get our staff or other leaders um, to hear more about this. We have, like Shad said, this is actually a two day full on seminary course that he taught for a while. And we have different versions of it. I have a one day training that I lead. Chad has a one day training. So you could bring one of us or both of us out um, to, to train your staff and uh, we could work and we, we try to make it really dynamic and, and kind of um, lots of discussion, Q and a time, but um, that's something that's an option as well. And so you can, you can let us know, send us an email, send us a direct message on social media, but no matter what, we're here for you guys. We love you and let us know how we can be praying and celebrating what you're doing. So until next time, God bless.